Psalm 11 uh, is a very interesting psalm. I don't plan when these things fall. I don't write out a preaching schedule uh, you know, like a year in advance. I used to, but what I found out as I started pastoring is sometimes the Spirit of God moves, uh, and my best laid plans for preaching for a whole year kind of went by the wayside, so I gave that up, I don't know, probably in my early 30s. Uh, psalm 11 is a powerful psalm, and uh, the more I studied it and, and read it this week, I could see the, the hand of God on it, especially with our nation, because the psalm addresses a, a simple question uh, that I don't have to explain all the world events to you or the national events to you to help you understand we're in trouble sometimes. We are uh, complex times. I thought times were complex when I was a kid in the 60s uh, with all that went on, the Vietnam War, the protests, all the things that went on that I saw as a child. Um, the injustices I saw when I went to South Carolina to see my relatives. I was from California. I didn't understand their world in South Carolina, how they functioned. Uh, and it, 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 so I've learned much in my lifetime. Uh, but these are complex, uh, dangerous times, uh, and God has a word. In fact, God is the word that we need to hear, and that's Psalm 11. Because Psalm 11 asks the question. Here's the question that it poses to us, which d is derived from the, from the text. How should Christians, how sh you could put your name in there, how should I respond to turbulent times? I mean, as my nation crumbles around me, how should I respond to that? Because David was in a similar predicament, as we're going to see as we look at this psalm, uh, as a young man, his nation was crumbling around him. And as a godly man, he's going to stop, and he's going to ask the question, which you've probably asked yourself, should I stand my ground and fight, or should I flee? Should I fight or should I flee? Because wisdom sometimes says you should stand your ground and fight, like our forefathers did to break free from tyranny. But, but then sometimes wisdom calls for you to, to back up uh, and, and to, to head in a completely different direction. Should you, should you fight or should you flee? Uh, and, and again, he's in a spiritual fight, as we're going to see. Uh, the historical background of this psalm is not known, but it, uh, it can be based on two things in, 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 in uh, David's life. Number one, it can be based on David's uh, fight with Saul, because King Saul realized he was going to lose his kingdom, and God was going to give it to David. So jealousy was his main motivation for getting rid of David. And so he hunted David. Uh, and tried to get rid of David. So that could be the background. Uh, or the other side of the equation, it could be when uh, the kingdom uh, slipped away as Absalom, uh, David's son, tried to take the throne from his father. Imagine you're the king, and your son tries to overthrow you. Sometimes when people oppose you, it's shocking who it is. Someone you did not anticipate. I lean more toward uh, 2 Samuel chapters 15 to 18, uh, that this is Absalom uh, usurping his father's role as the king. Uh, by various means, as we're going to say. But it, 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 it devolves down to, to David asking the question, as my world grumbles literally around me, what should I do? What should I do? Uh, and you, you can ask the same question, and probably you've asked the same question. Should I, should I stick around for more of this? And I've heard you pose these questions to me uh, over the years, uh, and even more so even today. Uh, uh, should I continue to serve at the Pentagon? Uh, should I continue to serve at the White House? Should I continue to serve at the CIA? We have all these people in our church, and it's a very difficult situation. Should I, should I stay there? Should I retire early and let somebody else try to handle the complexities which, which I see? Or should I stand on my biblical principles and not move? This is where David's at. Um, I have been in those kind of situations many times over the last 34 years of being a pastor where God opens doors uh, and he tells you, I want you to walk through that door. And you're thinking to yourself, yeah, I don't know if I want to walk through that door. Because if I walk through that door, it, it could be not pleasant. Uh, when I was uh, asked a couple years ago uh, by some staff over at Robinson High School to come over to the high school and speak to their uh, math and logic classes all day for eight straight hours, uh, I stood in a, in, a, in, a, in a room with a big uh, amphitheater room, and they would bring classes in and out all day. And I, there I was for an hour each time speaking to them about, is the Bible a trustworthy document? That's what they wanted me to talk about in a secular campus. So when they asked me that, I could have said what? It's great having people to talk to me during the service. It's so awesome. <laughs> so I, I could have said, I don't think I want to do that. Robinson High School? And, uh, you know, I, I, the, you know the, those, those teens are going to be all over the map. Uh, but I did it for several years, and it was awesome. I had a great time explaining to them why you can trust the translation of the Bible from the original documents. And they had tons of questions. So did the teachers. But I, I could have said no, knowing that that's a complex situation. Uh, years ago when they asked me to, to speak at the Pentagon for the National Day of Prayer, again, I know what that means. 
It's going to be televised to a couple million people. There was seating for 350 people in the amphitheater. 700 people showed up. People were everywhere. And there were guys in our church, uh, people with multiple stars on their uniforms. I didn't even know that they were a general officer. It was like shocking. Like, so good to see the church in uniform. <laughs> but anyway, I could have said, uh, Lord, I don't, I don't think I'm going to do that. I mean, I could say something that might offend somebody. You know, then I got a bunch of hate mail, and they try to cancel me. You know how that goes? Yeah, you familiar with the drill? But, but I did it anyway. And I'm not saying that I'm like the bravest person in the room, but when God opens a door, you're at, you have to ask this question. In troublesome times, what should I do? Should I fight the good fight of faith, or should I fold and head off, you know, and, and into infinity? So this is David's situation. He's going to give you three lines of, of reasoning of what you should do. Uh, to help you learn how to navigate with your complex situation. Uh, Number one, he's going to tell you, uh, please keep focused. Because when you head into tough times, it can get highly emotional and you can get out of focus. So he says, please keep focused. Notice how he begins. He says, to the chief musician, this is a psalm of David. We'll just stop right there. That's why it's highlighted. He said, I I wrote this song. Uh, What was his chosen instrument, by the way, just for Bible trivia purposes? Since there's actually people here to talk to me, Stratocaster. No, it was a harp, I think. Yes, was it not? He, that, was, that was their version of a Stratocaster guitar back in the day. And so David, in his troublesome time, stops, writes this song, and he writes it to the chief musician of worship at the temple. Now, I just, I find this highly interesting. And now that, that actually is part of the Hebrew text. So in my Hebrew Bible in my office, that particular line is verse one in the Hebrew text. It isn't in your Bible. But it is in the way, this is inspired word of God. Well, what can it teach us since all scripture is profitable? Well, here is David, a king and a warrior who's watching his nation crumble around him, people attacking him left and right, and he stops in the middle of it and he writes a song. How many here could say, I, I could do that? I could write a song. I took 10 years of piano. I, I could probably write a song. I don't know that I could sing it, but it's not simple to write a song, but he, he wrote a song. He's very prolific. Uh, and he writes this song to be sung in worship. So this was a song that Israel could sing in worship. came from their king and their warrior king who stopped and wrote this to them to sing to remember how great God is in trouble sometimes. Uh, you might not be able to write a song, but you probably have a song that you use in, in, in times when, when everything goes south on you. So if I were to tell you right now, we could actually go around the room, uh, what would be your go-to song that you would listen to when times are hard? You already have that song in mind right now, don't you? You already know what that song is. It's that song that you hear that puts everything in perspective theologically for you, and it ministers to your soul. Uh, One that I like uh, is the old standby, Great is Thy Faithfulness. It's a hymn. It's helped me many times. Great is Thy Faithfulness, O God my Father, there is no shadow of turning in thee. My, my, my world might turn, God doesn't. Thou changest not thy compassions, what? They fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever shall be. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. This is the God that you serve. See, it's those spiritual psalms, like this psalm, Psalm 11, that minister to the soul. And so David says, uh, keep focused on what I'm going to write about God. What does he say about God? Well, let's see what he says. He says, in the Lord I put my trust. I put my trust in the Lord. Um, In the Hebrew text, uh, this this starts with a preposition. Uh, And the the coronavirus didn't take the grammar out of me. I'm sorry. So (laughs) I majored in Hebrew. I love Hebrew. So when you look at this and it's a preposition, he's telling you it's totally emphatic. You really need to pay attention to what you need to do as you focus in, in tough times on God. He says, in God, I put my trust, or the, the Hebrew word for trust is the word for like a fortress. So if you're being attacked, where do you go? Well, you run to the fortress and you close the door uh, for protection. He says, God is, God is my trust. Um, it's very interesting. He says, the Lord is the object of my trust. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. What's that mean? Well, it's not capital L, small, small O-R-D. That'd be Adonai. This is Yahweh. Uh, now, this is not put in here by accident. Remember, the Spirit of God inspired the Word of God. So why did he choose this word? And then look at your text. You only have seven verses this morning. I think last week we actually covered 18 verses. It was a miracle from God. Today it's seven verses. He says, I put my trust in the, the Lord. 
Yahweh is his name. How many times does that occur in these seven verses? You have a Bible? Five times. Hmm, five times. Five times Yahweh occurs in seven verses. Reader's Digest might say, oh, that's a little overkill. When we do our translation of the Bible, eh, it's a little overkill of the name of the Lord. No, no, no. It's put in there five times because David says, when you keep your focus, remember who you're supposed to be focusing on. Because if you're watching the news, you're reading your favorite websites, you're seeing what's going on. I read the news this morning. It's not uplifting. It's not. It's depressing if you connect the dots where this goes. Uh, but if you keep your trust in the Lord, uh, who is he? he? Well, he's Yahweh. Who's Yahweh? This is the, the eternal name of God. He's the ontological one. He always is. So he's outside of time and space. He's beyond our dimension because we're limited. He's not. He's the one who always is. What does that mean to me? Well, it means that no matter happen, what happens in my world, no matter how south my nation goes, the one who always is is always with me. He hasn't looked the other way. He hasn't been caught off guard. He never looks at your life and goes, oops, I totally missed that. See, because he's Yahweh. He's the eternal one. He's the Lord who is. It's a tender truth. And see, as we look at the things around us, we tend to forget, forget to stay focused on the one who is. That's, that's God. So antagonists, they, they, sought, they sought to dethrone David, dismantle him, uh, take apart his leadership. And what did he do? I'll tell you what he didn't do. He didn't call his attorneys. He didn't call his general officers into his room for a quick meeting. Yeah, he didn't form a tiger team. I mean, all these things that they'll do in D.C., he didn't do those things. What did he do? He said, I put my trust in none of those things. I put him in the Lord, the living Lord. Why do you do that? Because here it works like this. If in my mindset I understand that God always is, then it's always going to be okay. Why? Because he's in absolute control. Uh, it says in uh, Matthew chapter 28, uh, verses 19 to 20, which is the Great Commission, uh, for Christians, Jesus is parting words to the church. What did he say? <clears throat> well, he's going to tell us what we're supposed to do until he gets back. So prior to the ascension, here's what Jesus said. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, of all the races, everybody. And he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. <clears throat> and then notice the promise. What did he say? Lo, I am with you some of the time because I'm super busy in the cosmos. Now, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. No matter how bad it is where you are, where you work, what you're doing, never forget that Jesus whisper, whispers in your ear, <clears throat> don't forget, I'm still with you. I'm, I'm the great Lord. I'm the I am. Hebrews chapter 13, and I'm going to probably need some water. Don't worry, I don't have COVID. Oh, it's over here. Talk among yourselves for a minute. This is my assistant for 40 years. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we had our 40th anniversary during that virus, and <clears throat> we were going to, wait just a minute, we were going to go to Hawaii and everything for our 40th. I'm like, hey, babe, you want to go to, like, Fredericksburg, kind of drive around? <laughs> like, yeah. Anyway, God's sovereign even of that. I do need to talk to him about that, by the way, that timing of that virus thing. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13, uh, verse 5. Uh, the author, who's unknown for the book of Hebrews, says, make sure that your character is free from, first one, love of money, being content with what you have. Well, that's a hard one, is it not? Well, not during the virus it wasn't, because you couldn't shop anywhere. But be content with what you have, for he himself, Jesus himself said, what did he tell you? I will never, I will never desert you, and I, and I will never forsake you. So no matter what situation God propels you into, no matter how uh, uh, d dystopic the world becomes and it falls apart, he says to you, I I'm with you. Don't fear. Don't fear. Don't fear. Uh, Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah, who was a great prophet of God, eventually paid for his uh, role as a prophet with his life. Uh, notice what he says uh, as he spoke against the sin of the nation. And if you want to read about the sins of the nation, just read Isaiah 5. It's the woe chapter to the nation from the prophet of God, Isaiah. What a brave man he was. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Do not fear, God says to Isaiah. I am with you some of the times, every now and then. No. I am with you. He says, do not anxiously look about you, which is easy to do, right, when you start checking out the morning news. He says, don't be anxiously looking about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will, I will hold you with my righteous right hand. Don't, don't fear him. 
I, I've chosen you as a prophet. You go speak to the culture and, and don't let your knees knock. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be right there empowering you to be the kind of man that you need to be. So David says at the very beginning, uh, as you look at the question, what should you do in trouble sometimes? He's telling you, stay focused. Stay focused on who God is. Don't look down, look up, as I've said a few weeks ago. How do you know when your trust is really in the Lord? How do you know your trust is really in the Lord? I thought of making this sermon a couple of sermons because of the content here. I'll give me some ideas of how you know that your trust is truly in God. Uh, and this is not an, uh, a, a complete list, just some ideas. Uh, how do you know your trust is in God? Uh, you're not angry at the Lord for what you're going through. You know, if you really love me, this wouldn't be happening. No, that's, that's not trusting God. You're not angry at God. Uh, you're talking to the Lord while you are in trouble. So if you stop talking to God and have that conversation with God, praying to God, you're not trusting God. But if the culture is going south and becoming complex, uh, the truly mature steps up to the plate and says, God, I need, I need to talk to you. I, I need to lay out before you what I'm seeing, what I'm feeling. Like, how, how, what, should I, what should I do? What should I say? Etc. Uh, you're reading the actual word of the Lord, and you're seeking wisdom and insight of how you should behave in said culture. Because that's, that's what you read all, all throughout the Old and New Testament. Saints went back to the word of God to listen to God to then understand what must they say. Uh, if you are uh, walking closely with God, uh, you will praise the Lord uh, for being the Lord of all times and seasons. Lamentation 3, 37 to 38, where he praises God, Jeremiah does, for the faithfulness of God and his nation just fell to the Babylonians in 586 B.C. And what's he do? He stops and he praises God. That even in the fall of my nation, you're sovereign, God, and I will not forget that you're sovereign even in this. Uh, second thing that you should do in trouble sometimes, verses uh, 1b through 3. Uh, please keep fearless. Be fearless. Be fearless. Uh, first, start off with the text. What, is, what does he say here? He says, how can you, and you, you have to ask yourself, who is he speaking to or who's speaking to him? How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? Uh, I'm going to put in perspective who that is. David's friends, his counselors, are coming to him and telling him what to do. Because he's going to them, as you do, seeking wisdom and counsel for your situation. What should I do? And I, bet, I don't even know how many times uh, people in our church have asked me this type of question. In my situation, where God has me, what should I do? Uh, so his friends are coming alongside of him uh, as his world is falling apart. And what is their advice? Their advice uh, is in the parentheses here. Well, David, our advice as your friends, in light of the fact that your kingdom is crumbling around you, and the, the, the godless outnumber you, it uh, doesn't look like it's going well for you. They control everything. What do we think you should do? What do they tell them to do? Flee as a bird to your mountain. I mean, get out of Dodge. Don't, don't stay in Jerusalem. Get, get out of town. Just, just disappear. Run away from everything. So their motto would have gone something like this. Uh, when the going gets tough, the tough get going out of town. This guy out of town, don't tell me you haven't thought about this. As times get really tough and get very complex, you're thinking to yourself, man, I gotta leave the city. I, I gotta get out of the city. I gotta go buy something off in the remote place where, I mean, it takes you know an hour to find a, a Walmart. And they're like everywhere, are they not? You know, I mean, who has not? And I've, I know people do this. I mean, you know, I, the, no, the motto is I need to flee. Uh, Think of the, the ramifications if David were, had fled. I mean, think about it. Because it's very tempting to flee. Because here's, here's why it's tempting. If you're the leader, well, you, you don't have to listen to griping and complaining anymore. Imagine. I'm just leaving politics. I'm leaving my office. Whatever the situation is, it's going to be so amazing to not be the person who's the point of the spear anymore. Um, he could sleep at night. Because he's not thinking about getting up the next morning and facing all he has to face. Uh, he could have had uh, some personal peace and rest. Uh, he wouldn't have to defend anything and everything that he said. And you know, anymore in our culture, you never know from day to day what you might say that might offend somebody. That changes daily. And he, it's like, I don't want to live in that world anymore, so I'm just going to flee just like my friends have said. Uh, years ago, my best friend Rick Seeley, who's now with the Lord, <coughs> came to me when he was 55 years old, at uh, my last church in California, <coughs> he was a uh, head of homicide, captain over homicide. And he came to me one day, and he said, uh, hey, hey, Marty, I have, I have a, I need some wisdom. He said, uh, at my career, I'm at the pinnacle of my career, I'm, I'm over homicide, um, I love what I do, but the op 
the option to become the sheriff is open for me. You know, and I could retire now and enjoy my life. He'd, he'd bought a house in Pismo Beach and could just go live there and enjoy his life. Or he said, I can become, I could strive to be the sheriff of the county. What do you think I should do? And so I told him, hey, Rick, as your good friend, as your pastor, I just want to tell you, sometimes God raises up men and women to be in certain positions. They don't retire. They don't flee. They fight the good fight of faith, and they impact those 1,300 officers underneath them for God. They need guys like you. What do you think he did? Well, he ran, he ran for office. That's what he did. Uh, he wasn't chosen to be uh, uh, the sheriff, and then within one year, he had died from cancer that he didn't even know he had. But, but he was willing to step into the gap to say, God, here I am, I'll, 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 I'll stand. See, that was David. See, David was up against the fight, but his friends are telling him, now we're kind of thinking you need to just leave, retire, call it, call it a day. David's not going to do that. Uh, verse 2 gives you the motivation for why they were telling him what they were telling him. Uh, this is the reason behind their counsel. Uh, they said to him, for look, the wicked bend their bow, they make their ready uh, of their arrow, it's on a string, they, they, that they may shoot secretly, not out in the open, that they may shoot secretly at the upright of heart. Uh, he grabs again in the Hebrew text uh, by using uh, the preposition uh, wedded to this uh, uh, word hene, which means to behold. When you take a preposition and you wed it to a word like behold, that's not a verb, it's in, totally emphatic. Uh, they're saying you need to stop and think about what the wicked are doing to you. They, it's like they have bows and arrows uh, and they're, they're getting ready to shoot at you and it's, they're coming from an, an area that you're not gonna see them uh, and they're gonna do it like in secret and they're gonna nail you. This is what they live for. David, why would you wanna stay and lead in an environment like that? Such as how people who are power hungry live. They have all kinds of arrows in our culture as they had in his culture, do they not? There's all kinds of arrows that they fire at you. Arrows like intimidation, blame, shame, you can just go down, down the list. And, and their friends, his friends are telling him, flee to the mountain because you know they're going to start shooting more arrows at you. Why would you want to take those kinds of hits? David is, is, uh, is one who's going to say, uh, I can't run. But before he does that, look at what they tell him in verse 3. These are his friends. They also tell him, hey, David, consider, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The foundations of what? Of the culture. Da David, they're destroying your culture, and you're not being able to stop them. Uh, what, do you, what should you do? And they tell him, if the, if the nation crumbles and fractures because it's balkanized, what are you going to do as a righteous man? You going to do anything? It's, who doesn't think about our own culture when you think about this? The crumbling of the culture. What should you do? Uh, David's going to look at the options. I can be fearless or I can be fearful. Uh, he's going to opt for being fearless, that he's not going to give in to uh, the destruction of his culture. Uh, you can, uh, the same thing is arrayed against us, the crumbling of said culture. Because all cultures are always in a state of crumbling until the day of Christ when he comes back to fix it. But in the meantime, what does he want godly people to do? Well, not, not to flee, but to stand your ground and represent Christ in the principles that can help uh, the culture. Remember what they did to Jesus? Um, I went back through the New Testament just to remind myself of what they did to my Lord when he walked among us uh, to be able to handle Jesus because he was so powerful in his teaching. Uh, they fired all kinds of arrows at him. They called him names. Um, uh, they, uh, the, in Matthew eleven eighteen, 18, they said he was demon-possessed. He was demon-possessed. See, the other side's really good. The goddess are really good at counter-projecting their sin onto you. They do it all the time. They did it to Jesus. He who can control the demons... They're saying, no, 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 no. You're, you're controlled by Satan, right? Um, when uh, Jesus uh, did things on the Sabbath, like healing people on the Sabbath, they accused him, like in Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 to 6, of breaking the law. No, they were the lawbreakers, not Jesus. They called him names. Uh, they even told him in uh, John chapter 8, verse 42, uh, that his birth through Mary was illegitimate. Imagine taking the, the virgin birth of Christ and telling him, now we, we think you're, verse, it's, it's, you're born in sin, not like us. Jesus uh, dealt with that. He stood his ground like a David did. 
Uh, but the opportunity can be to, to like fold like the old proverbial lawn chair and just kind of get out of the way so life's not so tough. But David says, no, keep, please keep focused. Focus on who God is. Uh, then he's going to tell him in, uh, in verses 4 to 7, he's going to close out his analysis of what to do by giving you some uh, fine-tuning. Some fine-tuning. Uh, do you remember when you, used to, when you could actually see a car engine when you opened it up? I mean, I bought my wife a, a car this year for, uh, at Christmas, and I opened the hood up of this new Volvo, and I can't see the engine. It's one giant piece of plastic. Uh, and, 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 and I told her, that I, okay, that's there for, you know, sound, but that's also to keep me out of it. <laughs> you know, I mean, I can't even change the oil. I've tried this before, because uh, they put it on the, the, I tried it. They put on uh, the oil filter with a compression wrench, and as strong as my forearms are, I couldn't even budget with my normal wrench. So anyway, remember engines when you could see them? I took auto shop back in, I don't know, 1975, 1976 in college, high school. Um, and uh, f- they popped open a Ford Mustang engine back, th- back in the day. They popped it open. I remember it was in the bay. They popped it open. You could see the engine. You could see all the cylinders. And you could use a timing gun to set the time. And uh, Remember doing this? Or am I way too old? No, I'm not. You remember this? Yeah, you wanted to fine-tune this thing to get this Mustang running great. So they turned all of us, you know, 16-year-olds, loose on this Mustang. We had a, it was awesome. Uh, now, I don't even want to do an auto shop. Now, come stare at the engine that's totally covered that you can't see it. But, but you want to fine-tune. David says that you need to fine-tune your thinking in tough times. Well, like how? Well, this is, this is key. Verse 4. He says, you must think about who God is. Well, who's God? He says, the Lord, notice where the Lord's located. He's in his holy temple. And then he says, the Lord's throne is in heaven. Remember, this is capital L-O-R-D. Whose name is that? It's Yahweh, the eternal God. He's always in his throne, and he's always sitting on his throne in heaven. He's always in the heavenly temple. This is another great study, just on, on the side, that the, the earthly temple that Solomon built, the earthly tabernacle, was merely a reflection of what exists in the heavenlies. And imagine one day when you are ushered into God's presence and see his face, you're going to see this, the temple of God Almighty and the throne of God Almighty. He says, David says, you need to keep a mindset of remembering where God is. He is the God who is, and he's always on his throne. So if he's always on his throne, he's always in control. Uh, you can't see it in the English text, but the, the copula here, the verb is, that is repeated here twice, might be italicized in your Bible, and it should be, because it's not in the Hebrew text. And that might mean absolutely nothing to you, but it does mean a lot to me because if you don't have a verb in a sentence, it's called ellipsis. And it's not by accident. It's left out to make it completely emphatic in the Hebrew text. The Lord in his holy temple. The Lord's throne in heaven. He leaves it out to make you stop and think as a Hebrew reader, man, this is like a speed bump. I who tend to, tend to look around at my world and get all anxious and upset and fearful, I got to think about who God is. He's the God on his throne, which means if he's on his throne and in his temple, what have I got to worry about? Because all these kingdoms are going to go by the wayside. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 21, uh, Daniel, a young man, a prophet of God, uh, in captivity with the Babylonians, uh, says this to the king, the king who holds life and death in his hand. Verse 21, he tells the king, he, God, changes the times and the seasons. He does what with kings? He removes them. He raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He tells King Nebuchadnezzar to his face, you might be the king of the most powerful nation on the planet, but you only sit on that throne because God Almighty put you there. And this is his captor. He's the slave. Jesus, years later, is put on trial uh, by a bunch of godless men who don't like what he has to say. They want to silence him. Uh, and he, at one point of his trial, he stands before Pilate. Pilate, the weak-kneed politician who won't do the right thing. Yeah, Pilate uh, and Jesus have a conversation. It says, then Pilate said to him, you are not speaking to me. It says, do you not know that I have power to crucify you and, and power to release you? Don't, he tells Jesus, basically, you don't realize who you're talking to. I'm Pilate. What does Jesus say to him? Does he flex and freeze? No. He, like David, stands with great faith. Verse uh, 11, Jesus answered and told this uh, potentate, 
He says, you could, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has, has the greater sin. He looks at him and says, you're the ruler over this little part of the earth? Well, my heavenly father put you here to be the leader. And you're only doing what you're, what you're doing right now because it's all part of my father's plan to save people by guiding me to be crucified. See, this is full control. Even in the most worst case scenario, God was in full control as he sent his son to the cross. Back in 1981, uh, I took a, a class uh, at Dallas Seminary, and there was a new professor uh, that had just finished his PhD. His name was Dr. Tony Evans. Uh, maybe you've heard of him. What a great teacher. He said lots of great things. One day in class, this is what he said. He said, gentlemen, and I was, I was 22 at the time. He said, gentlemen, never forget that God can always take a, a crooked arrow and hit a target. We're crooked people. We're born with sin. But he said he can take those things in his sovereignty and strike the purpose of that target that he wants every single time and never miss. See, that's what happened at the cross. The devil thought it was a miss. And the father says, no, I'm in full control. I'm on my throne. So I tend to think we forget that God's on his throne. And what is God doing with us while he's on that throne? It says in verse uh, 4 and 5, His eyes behold us. His eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous. Twice he tells us he tests us. He tests us. It says his eyes behold us, which means he's always watching you. Remember, I told you earlier, I'll tell you again. He never takes his eyes off you. He never looks at your life and says to the angels around him, Why weren't you guys helping me? Why didn't you let me know what was going on in their life? Why didn't you let me know what they were up against? No. Now his eyes are always on you. And what's interesting here, when it says his eyelids are, uh, test the sons of men, what in the world is that about? Uh, this is where you have to know Hebrew. Uh, the Hebrew here means he squints when he looks at you. Now this happens to you like around 40, doesn't it? It did to me. I mean, my vision's 2800. I can't even see you if I take my glasses off. So the, the, the girl here is squinting. But you, why are you squinting? You don't squint yet? You will. She's squinting so she can see a little bit better, right? See, he says, it's not really the eyelids. He's talking about how when you squint, your eyelids drop down, which means Jesus has super focus on you. Super focus. Why? What's he doing? He's testing you. This is what this is all about. The complexity of our culture, what's it ultimately all about? It's that God can test people to see, do you... Do you love me? Are you maturing in the faith? Do you not know me? You need to know me? He's testing all the time. He's testing. Um, haven't you ever looked at a test from God? I have, and told him, God, I think I got this test. We've been through this test many times, Lord. I think I totally understand it. Don't tell him that. Because guess what happens? He's going to look down from heaven and go, no, you don't quite get it yet. You know, it, he tests you. Why does he test you? A whole sermon in and of itself. I'll give you a couple of ideas why God tests you. He's testing us now. He's testing our nation. He's testing his church all across the, the world, the country. He's testing all of us as believers to say, in these complex times, what are you going to do? Are you going to fight for the faith or are you going to flee? What does testing do? Uh, it helps you come to terms with whether you're going to follow God no matter what. Remember old Abraham? Commanded to give up his son as sacrifice. What did God really want to know? David, or Abraham, will you follow me no matter what? Abraham said, yes, Lord, you know I will. He, will you follow him? Uh, he'll uh, use this to change how you think about things. Because the older you get, you get stuck in ruts of how you think about things. And God says, let, let me give you some insight through a test to help refine your thinking so you think more like me, less like you. Um, He'll burn out the dross in your life to sin. This is, this is what testing does. He'll send tough times to your life to burn out things that don't need to be there to be replaced by godly things. God gives you the opportunity in a test to glorify him. That even the middle of a test, be what it may, that you can stop and say, God, you're sovereign. I, I pause to give you glory because of who you are. I mean, there's many, many things that God does in test. They're never aimless. In the current situation we find in our own nation as 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 fractured as our nation is, God's looking at the nation and saying, I have the answers to your systemic issues. It's sin. And my people need to listen and learn how to navigate in a way that they can be Christ to the culture. There's also a, a warning here. David says to the people who don't like God, 
It says in verse 5 and 6, but the wicked uh, and he who loves violence, his soul hates. It says upon the wicked he will rain, per future tense, will rain coals, fire and brimstone, and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. See, this is what the wicked who, who live in a wicked way within our culture, this is what they forget. They forget that one day they will stand toe-to-toe with the wrath of God against their sin. One day, as in Noah's day, the door closes to the ark, and God says, now comes judgment. See, we're living in the, the time right now of grace, where God is patient and merciful. But one day, David says, they, they forget that the holy God that's in his temple will say enough of what I see, and then he comes in judgment. What does that mean for me as a Christian? Well, I have to think, what should a Christian do in troublesome times? Should I flex? Or should I, be fear, should I be fearful? Should I stand my ground and fight? David says, no, I'm gonna stand and be God's leader in tough times. And he's also throwing these last words in here to tell you what you should do, and that's teach your culture about who God is. Notice the last verse. What does he say about God? He says, for the Lord is, what is he? He's righteous. He's, right, he's righteous. He loves righteousness. He hates sin. It says, his countenance beholds the upright. His eye is on you, David says. Don't forget that. That as you stand up for his righteousness, don't worry, he's gonna be with you. And if you don't have his righteousness because you don't know him, well, we know he stands ready to give you his righteousness. That's why he died for us. That's the problem our culture needs solved is man's sin issue. Because once they come to know Christ, then they know peace, right? Then they know justice. They know all the things that our culture clamors for. But might we be the kind of people who lovingly, compassionately, and courageously will act like David did in tough times? He was a, great, a man of great courage. Let's pray. God, thank you just for David's pen. Uh, it inspires us. It motivates us. Uh, may we stand in the gap as Isaiah did in his day to count the cost to bear his cross, to follow hard after you, to speak truth uh, to those who don't want to hear truth, and to point them to the power of the cross, which can change a man or a woman for all eternity and give them wisdom for living in the here and now. We pray for our culture. It needs the Christ. It needs the gospel. And it needs saints to stand sure-footed in tough times. May we be those people in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy July 4th. You can talk now. It's, a, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully you have a, have a good day with your family, so. I think we have limited koinonia here, so. So you are dismissed if you would like to leave, so.